Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, thank you very much for joining me for a little tasting, a very, very unusual tasting, actually, uh, for Glen Rothes. I'll explain why in just a second. But first, I guess I better introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kieran Elliott. Uh, I've been with the Edrington Company for seven years now. Uh, I was the national brand ambassador for the McCallum for five years. Uh, and I, over the last two years, I've uh, been in national accounts as the National Accountants Manager, covering the whole portfolio. And that's probably one of the reasons I'm, I'm here today to, to cover off on a different one of our single malt scotches. Uh, as you can probably tell, uh, I'm from Scotland itself, uh, between Glasgow and Edinburgh, uh, but I've uh, always had a, a hankering for scotch, grew up with distilleries littered around the place. So I certainly had that in my, my blood and my bones as I was growing up. Now, uh, normally I'm used to talking about the McCallum because that's what I did for so many years. And occasionally, back in the day, way, way back in the day, I would talk about Highland Park. But because, because we only really recently reacquired Glen Rothes, it's not my normal go-to for these presentations. So this is really exciting for me. I'm actually really, really jazzed about this. So this is absolutely excellent. And this tasting in particular will be very rare and very unusual because we're going to be tasting through heritage bottlings, essentially. Bottlings that were uh, on full release under Berry Brothers and Rudd before Edrington took back control three years ago. Uh, and we're slowly phasing out these bottlings. So this is probably and possibly the only or the last time we'll do a tasting with these whiskies. So very unusual, very rare and, and very exciting for me. So I'm, I'm, I'm just over the moon to be here and to be doing this. Now, I mentioned the Edrington bought back the bottling rights. The history of Glen Rothes is very unusual, tumultuous, uh, steeped in tragedy and craziness in the early days. And then in more recent years, it's gone through uh, multiple hands, eventually coming back to us here at Edrington. Uh, but the, the way the, the distillery came into being was really part of our DNA as well. But as I said, three years ago, we bought back the bottling rights. Uh, and the first thing we did was introduce the age statements, the 10, the 18, uh, there is one non-age statement, the whiskey maker's cut and the 25. So we really worked hard to get these age statements back out. But before I go any further, I think it makes sense to do a whiskey 101. Because even if you are a Scotch expert, aficionado, enthusiastic amateur, whatever, it's always good to go over the basics and just cover off on the, the sort of the nuts and bolts of Scotch whiskey. So very, very, very basically, uh, a whiskey is a grain alcohol that can be made anywhere in the world using any combination of grain. There's great, uh, uh, great whiskies coming out of Japan, uh, great whiskies coming out of Tasmania, India even, obviously great whiskies coming out of America. But if you want to be called Scotch by law, you have to adhere to the five rules of Scotch, the five laws of Scotch. It has to be made on Scottish soil, aged for a minimum of three years in oak casks. And that maturation process also has to happen on Scottish soil. And it has to be a minimum of 40% ABV alcohol by volume, same as 80 proof. Now that's just to be called Scotch. And I say by law, because we have a legal body, the SWA, it stands for Scotch Whiskey Association. It's not Scotties with Attitude. Uh, and it's the Scotch Whiskey Association's job to search the world looking for anyone using the word Scotch illegally and come down on those people like a ton of bricks. It's a geographical indicator, a GI, a bit like cognac or champagne in France. It's one of those things that we use to protect uh, the validity of Scotch whiskey. Other people can use the word whiskey, other people can use the word single malt, but they can't use the word Scotch. That is specific uh, to us. And believe me, people around the world, uh, in particular India, have tried multiple times and we have the legal body to go and chase them down to try and keep that GI uh, specifically for us. Now that's just Scotch. There are multiple categories within Scotch. Uh, Scotch is a sort of catch-all. And within Scotch, approximately 91, 92% of the sales of Scotch worldwide, blended Scotch. For years, for decades, blended Scotch was the category. And then single malt started to come through into prominence in the 80s in particular. 
Now, uh, there's a great uh, prevalence around at the moment for people to say, oh, no, no, I don't drink blended scotch. I only drink single malt. Oh, no, no. One of the things I try to make sure everyone realizes is if it wasn't for the blended scotches, the single malts, many of the single malts would not have survived 60s and 70s. Uh, the single malts really only came into their own in the 80s and beyond. So we owe that to the blends. Uh, and if you've never had Famous Grouse 18, you have never lived. That is a bottling and a half. It's absolutely fantastic. So make sure you try as many blends as well. Don't have that in your head. That blended scotch it is in any way inferior to the single malts. It's just a different type of whiskey. Technically speaking, your average bottle of blended scotch is approximately 70% neutral grain spirit. It's made in a different type of still, a column still, a coffee still invented by Innes Coffee, an Irish guy. Uh, and he, it's a continually running still, makes a less expensive, but uh, lacking in character ever so slightly, uh, you know, alcohol. And so to give it the character that it's missing, you blend in single malts to give it that lovely flavor that you're looking for, hence blended whiskey, approximately 30% is single malts. So that's how you build a blend. Then there's a sliver of a style in the middle called blended malt, but there's no neutral grain spirit. It's just a bunch of malts put together. And that gives the master blender some amazing blank canvas, carte blanche to go nuts. You know, you pull in a bit of Isla whiskey, you pull in some Highland stuff, you bring in some Lowlands for the grassiness and you build something completely unusual. It really is a great skill. And there's only a few of those in there. Uh, we have Naked Grouse, there's Monkey Shoulder, there's a Compass Box, uh, Johnny Walker Green. There's only a few bottlings in blended malt. They're definitely worth uh, searching out, especially Naked Grouse, because Naked Grouse is McAllen Highland Park and Glen Rothes, and sometimes a few other bits and pieces, but mainly Edrington malts. But then you've got the, the, the sort of higher echelon, if you will, because you're, you're starting to get down to a more specific style, and that is single malt. Single malt, the, there's an extra two rules, two laws to be called single malt, uh, single and malt. The single part of single malt refers to a single geographical location, i.e. it can only be made at one distillery. And uh, malt part refers to only using malted barley. In neutral grain spirit, there can be corn, there can be uh, barley, wheat, you know, any other spelt, any other types of grain. But in single malt, it's uh, barley, malted barley, because essentially that's what grew best in Scotland hundreds of years ago when we were developing how to make this golden nectar. And then just to, to cover back off in American whiskies a little bit, uh, the Brits, when they went stampeding over to America three, four hundred years ago to colonize, they took their barley with them to plant so they could keep making their, their Scotch whiskey. But the barley, uh, when they arrived in sort of the um, uh, New England, the barley wouldn't grow as well as the rye they were finding lying around. So they switched to rye, hence rye whiskey. And as we, further, uh, we moved further south into the Carolinas, the rye wasn't growing as well as the corn they were finding lying around. So they switched to corn, hence bourbon. So it's really just an evolution of the same drink. And just to, to, to let you know, the word whiskey is actually a Scottish word. It's derived from the Scots Gaelic word, uski. Uh, the full term is uski beta, or sorry, uski ba. Uski beta is the Irish pronunciation. Uski ba means water of life. And over the years, uski just changed and morphed into the word whiskey. So it's a, a Scottish word, we're very, very proud of that. And uh, Uski Ba is water of life. We'll talk about water a little bit later on because that's what part of our sort of charity element, if you will. We're going to do a, a guided nosing and tasting with the first whiskey in just a second. Uh, but I'm going to do a quick piece on the history of Glenrothes. Uh, up until last week, I knew a little bit, but I didn't know as much as I do now. I did a Whiskey 101, which you can find on my Facebook page, uh, uh, Edrington Kieran Elliott on Facebook. I did a whole history piece on Glenrothes, Highland Park, and McAllen. Uh, but the, the brand was founded in uh, 1879. Now that's approximately 100 years after some of the distilleries were formed. Uh, for example, one of my uh, favorites, Glen Turret, which was actually in Edrington's portfolio for a while. It's my home distillery in Creef in Scotland in the, the sort of Perthshire Highlands. Uh, Glen Turret was founded in 1775, one year before America. Uh, and then Highland Park, back there, you can see, was founded in 1798. 
Now, that was the year they were founded. That wasn't the year they started making whiskey. That was the year they got caught. Uh, we were distilling illicitly up in the mountains and in the valleys for, for years and years before that. And eventually the tax man caught up with them. Uh, and the old brand ambassador for Highland Park used to say, these ones, these ones that say they're older, they're, they're not any better. They just get caught faster. Doesn't make them better. Uh, but Glenrothes, unlike those older ones, uh, was founded in a slightly different way. You know, obviously 1879, whiskey had been around for a long time. And in fact, the guy who founded Glenrothes, James Stewart, it was actually an employee at Macallan at the time. And he was like, oh, I love Macallan. It's, it's rich, it's full-bodied, it's unctuous, there's loads going on, super oily. But that's one style. I'd quite like to, now that we're getting into this whole blended scotch thing, because this was around the time blends started to really come into their own. He's like, I want to create something lighter, gentler, more approachable, a little bit more your, your everyday drinker rather than, you know, something big and boisterous. So he literally founded Glenrothes specifically to create a lighter, gentler, more effervescent spirit, but also specifically to aim it towards the blending process, which hadn't been done uh, much up until that point. So really a different way of coming about. And just to cover off on the name as well, uh, Glenrothes, the Glen part of a Scotch whiskey, you might have heard, you know, of all, all the Glens, you know, you talk about the Glens, Glen uh, Livet, Glen Fiddick, Glen Orangey, all of those guys, loads of Glens. The Glen part refers to a valley. In Scotland, a Glen is a valley. And in Rothes, refers to the river that runs through that valley. So you've got Glen Livet, the, the river Livet runs through the Glen. Uh, so Glen Rothes is really just in reference to where the whiskey was made. And the reason we have so many Glens is if you're illicitly distilling way up in the mountains, trying to avoid the tax man, the best place to do it is in a little you know, river valley that's hidden way up in the hills. The trees help dissipate the smoke from the stills and no one can see you and you're up to your business and no one can come and try and tax you. Uh, but by the time we got to Glenrothes, it was an established thing to call it Glen something. So they made it uh, on the, the Rothes burn. A burn is a, a small river. You need a clean water source to make good whiskey. Uh, so they built up the Glen, uh, the Glen Rothes name. Now, I said tragedy. Uh, the day the first drop of liquid ran off, the first, the first ever run of a still, the first drop of liquid uh, came off the still, uh, 28th of December, 1879. That was the same day as there was a terrible rail tragedy in Scotland. It was uh, the fourth river, uh, sorry, the Tay River, they're very close together. Uh, the, the Tay River comes to an estuary by the city of Dundee and they had a, they just recently built a rail track over it. And on the 28th of December, super cold, Terrible storm, a train went over, the bridge collapsed, 75 people died on the first day, the first day of the run. And then with, over the next 70 to 80 years, there was four or five separate explosions or fires that nearly destroyed the entire distillery or one of the warehouses. So there was always something going on. In fact, even before it was built, uh, there was a banking crisis. They had uh, Jim Stewart had decided to start this distillery, and while it was underway, there was a banking crisis, and it nearly didn't even come together at all. Uh, but there was a, a loan or a, a gift, if you will, from a very unusual source. A local church gave a gift of six hundred pounds, about eight hundred dollars, to continue the project. It's the only reason the distillery got built. And I just love the fact, you know, this is in the late 18, 1800s. I love the fact that the, the minister would be up there, you know, Scottish minister, you know, uh, Presbyterian, very, very staunch. They'd be up there in the pulpit going, thou shalt not drink here. By the way, start a distillery. I just, I love that. <laughs> How Scottish is that? Really? Um, now, one of the explosions, one of the fires uh, was in 1922. So maybe only about 30 years-ish since the distillery was, was founded. Uh, but there was a huge explosion in one of the uh, warehouse number one and we lost uh, 200,000 imperial gallons, 910,000 litres of whiskey. Almost a million litres of whiskey uh, were lost in one evening. Uh, the grandfather of one of the warehouse, you know, the, actually the general manager, was repairing a cask and he knocked over a candle and whoa, the place went up. 
Now, legend has it that as soon as word got around the village of Rothis, all the villagers come running out with buckets and cups and anything they could find. And at first they were like, brilliant, they're coming to grab water and throw in the fire. They weren't, they were coming to steal the whiskey and take it home. And then apparently the next day, the cows, the cows were swaying gently in the fields. And apparently, according to legend, the trout were easier to catch in the streams. I'm not sure if that's true, but it's a great story. I love a good story. Now, one year later, in 1923, we started a relationship that really founded the blending process, founded Glen Rothes, and started a great partnership with a company called Berry Brothers and Rudd. Berry Brothers and Rudd is a, a fantastic, long-running, great heritage, a British import-export company, but they also have their own whiskies. They're an independent bottler. They would buy casks. Phenomenal company, one that we've been involved with for, for hundreds of years. So they partnered with Glen Rothes specifically because they loved that lighter style. And what they did was they created a brand called Cutty Sark. Now, these days, Cutty Sark is kind of the green bottle at the back of your grandma's scotch cabinet, right? It's that kind of old style, oh, that's, that's from, that's my grandmother's grandfather's scotch. But in the 1920s, this became the blended whiskey. Cutty Stark was a blended whiskey that launched the blended category in America during Prohibition. Fantastic. Um, you know, so Prohibition, 1920 to 1933, uh, they were running, rum running, they were alcohol smuggling, Cutty Stark in particular, into New York. And a, a great, great story that we talk about, uh, we, we used to have Cutty Stark in our portfolio, but one of the things we've always talked about is there was only one alcohol smuggler that you could trust, only one, would bring in the barrels of Cutty Sark at exactly 100 proof. These barrels were sent out at 100 proof, and uh, this guy would always bring in at exactly 100 proof. He wasn't stealing it and watering it back up, or watering it down, if you will. It was always 100% proof, 50% alcohol, and that guy was called Captain William S. McCoy, Captain Bill McCoy, and to this very day, we remember his name because he was so precise and so honest and so trustworthy. To this day, we talk about that is the real McCoy. And that is phenomenal. I, I think that's a great, great story from, from almost exactly 100 years ago. We're still remembering the honesty of Captain Bill McCoy. So there we are. Now, I've talked long enough. I, I know from my five years on uh, McCallum, I can hold your attention longer right at the start. Once we start the drinking, it goes downhill. In the best possible way, of course. So uh, we're now going to move on to... Uh, more of a, a guided nosing and tasting. Uh, I have my box. Uh, Shri, thank you very much for, for sending my box <coughs> of, uh, of, of the three that we're going to be tasting right now. Uh, I asked them to send me them. Not that I don't have them. I just didn't want to chip into my source. Now, um, we're going to start with the lightest of the three. There's the bourbon cask reserve, there's the sherry cask reserve, and then there's the venti reserve. And each of these really represents a specific style, not just at Glenrothes, but in Scotch whiskey as a whole. You see, um, up until the 60s, most Scotch whiskey uh, companies were aging in sherry casks. It was very much the rage. And in particular, uh, Macallan had insisted on sherry seasoning for a long, long time. It became our signature style. But in the 60s uh, and then into the 70s, the Brits, of whom I am one, being Scottish, we haven't got independence yet, one day. Uh, the, the Brits absolutely destroyed the sherry category. They created uh, cream sherries and really cut-priced cheap sherries. And you know, sherry was a big, big deal up until the 60s and 70s. And then this low-cost, really dreadful style of, of sherry decimated and basically killed the sherry industry. And what happened was we... Edrington, all the other Scotch companies just couldn't get enough sherry casks to age the whiskey in the way they used to. But at this point, you know, in the 60s, American whiskies were really starting to come off, really starting to, you know, explode in popularity, uh, incredible styles, incredible selection. So American oak barrels started to become way more uh, prominent and less expensive and way more available. And exacerbated by the fact that at the end of World War II, 
the American government sent out a decree that American oak barrels used for bourbon could only be used once by law. And that was a, an arcane law, or it was an arcane law now, but the law was specifically to keep the guys in work, to keep the guys in, in, in operation, give them something to do. You can only use it once, then you have to make a new one. It was literally to drive industry. Now that meant that we in the Scotch whiskey industry could pick up these, these barrels, these standard American barrels, 200 litre barrels for next to nothing because Sherry had just disappeared. So uh, everyone kind of switched to American oak uh, and American oak grows quicker. It also American oak, uh, the, the trees are very, very straight. American oak is just a straight up and down. The, the Coopers much prefer to use American oak because there's fewer knots, which they have to try and avoid. Very, very straight, make excellent planks. Uh, European oak tends to bifurcate. It's those trees that have got, you know, the right at the root of bifurcates and then there's another bifurcation and then it's all over the shop. Those are really, really hard to, for the Coopers to make into casks. Uh, also, they, they come to maturity at approximately 120 years as opposed to 80 years. For an American oak tree. So uh, bourbon is the, the lighter style, it's the more predominant style in Scotch whiskey. But we'll talk about the sherry in just a second. We're going to, if you'd like to reach into your little rainbow pack, into your little pack there, Shree's ahead of the game. He's very swirling, he's got it going and everything. There you go. Uh, I would like you to open up your bourbon cask reserve. Little mini. What are these 100 mils? A maxi mini. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any Glenn Roth's glasses. So I've got a Helen Park one, I've got uh, one from the Masters, I went to the Masters a couple of years ago, and then I've got one from Arnold Schwarzenegger's fifth annual poker tournament. <laughs> I used to do this poker tournament every year right. at his house with Arnie there. Uh, that, was, that was a great fun. I need to get an invitation to that. Know, name dropping, name dropping. Oh, I just dropped that over there. Look at that name. <laughs> there. There That's what happens when you live in LA, Karen, come on. I, I know. Need an invitation yeah. to that. I was like, Arnie, please stop calling me. I said yes, I will definitely come. <laughs> <laughs> right, so let me let me just quickly tell you about this. Uh, one of the things about the poker tournament is he invites all sorts of stars. Um, uh, Sylvester Stallone was there. Uh, the, the British guy from all the action films. What's his name? The shaved head. Jason. Jason. Statham. 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 Yeah. But he has a whole bunch of animals at the the event. And in the first two years I did it, he had an elephant there. And it was the elephant from the movie Water for Elephants. A bigger, bigger movie star than Arnie. <laughs> so we're going to pour out a nice, healthy dram. Now, uh, a dram, you might hear Scottish people or, or people in the whiskey industry talking about a dram. A dram is not a specifically organized amount. A dram is just something. It's not a gel, it's not milligrams, it's just some. Just make sure you get some in there. And I often get asked about glassware. Uh, what's the best glass to use? And technically speaking, according to the Scotch Whiskey Association, it's these little guys. These are called Glencairn glasses. Shri has his. Uh, these are Glencairn glasses. This is the official glass of Scotch Whiskey as uh, decreed by the Scotch Whiskey Association. But if, you're being, if I'm being completely honest, the only glass I absolutely insist on is a clean glass. As long as it's clean, I don't mind. So here we are. Dree, where's our glass? What's that? <laughs> we didn't send glasses out. We didn't get the glass in here. We're... <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. We should offer a rainbow pack with the glass with Glenn Rothis on it. Uh, Lindsay's right, right here. She can. She's the one who can make it happen. <laughs> These are great ideas. Lindsay, Lindsay, take note. Fantastic. Write it down. Brilliant. Brilliant. Take oh, notes. So the the glass is shaped to, to give the, the the top as much surface area as possible in the bulb of the glass, and then it concentrates the flavors of the glass so that when you take a nose, that you get more intense flavors. But because of that, there's a couple of things that you can do. I love to do a guided nosing and tasting because there's a couple of things you can do to help access the lovely flavors in behind the alcohol. Because if your preferred method of drinking your single malt scotch is this, spring drink! Fabulous. I love your efficiency. But what you get is a whole bunch of burn and a little bit of flavor. If you want to reverse that and get a whole bunch of flavor and a little bit of burn, there's a couple of things you can do to help access the flavors in behind the higher alcohol. Now, the first thing you do is something you don't do. You don't swirl whiskey. 
especially if it's your first dram of the evening, after you've had a couple, you can do what you want, right? Uh, but the first one, you don't want to be swirling it. You swirl wine. Wine is between 12 and 14% on average. Uh, you swirl wine to give it a high surface area so that it evaporates and those lovely gentle flavors uh, rise up the glass and you can pick them off, you know, because wine is it's, it's hard to get a flavor of wine. Um, with scotch, it's a minimum of 40% ABV. We normally bottle at 43 and, you know, Cutty Sark Pro is 50%. So you don't want to swirl it. You don't want to agitate it, as they say in wine. It creates too high a surface area and it sends far too much alcohol. In fact, a good scotch is like a good Scotsman. It's agitated enough, thank you very much. <laughs> it doesn't need any extra agitation. It's hurtling itself up that glass. If you plummet your schnoz in there and take a big pull, all that's going to happen is you're going to burn off your olfactory senses. You won't be able to smell or taste much for the rest of the night. So you just want to hold it up to your chin and let those lovely vapors rise up. Now, normally, right, five years as a national brand ambassador at McAllen, for years I said, now, uh, one, of my, one of my markets is San Francisco, and San Francisco is a great mixology city. And anytime you get great mixology, you get great facial hair. And there's nothing funnier for brand ambassadors than watching these mixologists, uh, you know, nosing their scotch and dunking their big lumberjack beard into their scotch and then wondering why everything tastes and smells like scotch for the next four days. Because of COVID, I have that beard! This is the first time I've talked about it with my own beer in the glass. Anyway. <laughs> it's just a, just, a, just a moment for me. I, I have literally seen people do this. <laughs> so what you want to do is let those lovely vapors rise up your nose. You're trying to catch them on the edge of perception. You, you, you don't want to get a big rush of it because it will burn off your olfactory senses. So just let those lovely vapors rise up. Now, I want you to breathe in through your nose and your mouth. Yeah, open your, your, your lips, part of your lips, and literally breathe in through both. You just want to catch it right on the edge. Now, on this one, it's 100% ex-bourbon, American ex-bourbon cast. And American oak gives us two particular flavor profiles, citrus and vanilla. There's other bits and pieces in there, but those are the two strident. Those are the two big, rich flavors that you're going to get. Uh, when, you, when I first talk, started to talking about whiskey and I talked about citrus, for me initially it was a little disingenuous because it didn't smell like lemon and it didn't taste or smell like orange. It wasn't until somebody said, it's grapefruit. It's that rich grapefruit element. It's, it's a grapefruit citrus. It's not orange, it's not lemon. Now that I've said that, try and imagine grapefruit. It, as soon as I said, as soon as somebody pointed that out to me, grapefruit leapt out of the grass. The grass. So I get that lovely that lovely sort of sharp grapefruit to begin with. And then when you go back in for your second, you know, you take it away, take a deep breath, go back in a second time. And then you start maybe picking up on those heavier flavors like the vanilla, and then take it away, breathe out, breathe in. Downward dog, no. <laughs> <laughs> like this body's ever done yoga. Um, back in the third time, third time you get again, richer and heavier and deeper flavor profiles. And every time you go in, you might pick up something different. Now, I'd like to point out at this point, uh, if you're sticking your nose in there and all you can smell is scotch, fabulous. Don't worry about it. That's fine. Nose the next one, nose the next one, nose the next one, and eventually you'll build up a profile of what you like. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter if you can get, I mean, I could list 300 tasting notes that I have found off websites and of people who are like, oh, yes, I get 30 plus tasting notes. Bug it off. If you if you just taste it, smell it, taste the next one, and just just figure out what you like. That's all that matters. Knows knows all of your scotches. That's the main thing. Um, as a brand ambassador, you you hear all sorts of weird and wonderful tasting notes. Uh, my my three favourite. I mean, some of them are outrageous, but my three favourite in a, a ascending or descending order. I'm not sure. In third place, it's like scampering naked through a field full of thistles. <laughs> I'm not sure if they were wearing a hilt at the time or what, but uh, that's, uh, that, that was a good one. Uh, my second favourite was, it, it, it's reminiscent of my grandpa's sock drawer circa 1974. I'm, I'm going to assume that's going to musty, uh, I'm not sure about that one, but my all-time favourite, 
all time favourite is. Uh, and it was in reference, oh no, no, I'll tell you the taste of first. It, it was, it smells like a dumpster fire outside a clown school. <laughs> <laughs> who, who spends that much time outside clown schools in dumpsters? I don't know. Uh, it was in reference to a heavily peated Southern Isla whiskey. I'm not going to tell you which one, Lafroy. Uh, but that was that was my all time favorite. <laughs> but, <laughs> disclaimer: I really like all of the Isla whiskeys. They're all for my children to me. Right now, um, this is a lighter style of whiskey, so you get citrus and vanilla and a lighter color as well. Uh, the color really, oh, well, the color's the next thing we talk about. The color, the color tells us. Absolutely nothing. A darker scotch isn't older, it isn't more expensive, it isn't better, it's just darker. The reason I tell you that is most single malt companies add something called spirit caramel. It's an industrial uh, food color and it darkens the whiskey. Um, we at uh, McAllen, Helen Park, Glen Roth, 100% natural color, have never added spirit caramel. It doesn't make us better, it just means we're holding ourselves uh, to a higher echelon. So that's just something to keep in your head. And then finally we taste, right? <laughs> I did this at one tasting and I said, you know, I get the, the talking out of the way then, then now finally we taste and a wee voice down the front went, oh, thank God. <laughs> right. When you taste, I want you to take a tiny little bite and chew it five or six times. The smaller the bite you take, the more you chew it, the more you break down the alcohol, break down the oils, get the flavour in behind the alcohol and get more flavour. So if you would, ladies and gentlemen, slange of our Little bite, chew it. Mm. Mm. Now, the first thing I get that I didn't get in the nose was banana. There's a lovely sort of, almost sort of green, almost, you know, kind of gentle banana. And then yeah. as, it, as it evolves, mm. a little bit of coconut. Um, gotcha. the, the vanilla is still there. The citrus is still there. Mm. Almonds, a little bit sort of toasted almond. Very, very gentle, very light. Oh, what a bit of white chocolate there. Again, if, if, you, if you're tasting or nosing something else, that's absolutely fine. Uh, these are just what pops out to me. Uh, and everyone's palate is different. Everyone's preferences is different. Everyone's perception is different. So I'm just telling you what I get. Uh, is anyone brave enough to speak up on the, on the Zoom feed and, and tell me what, what they're getting? Are you getting anything different? Do any of those tasting notes jump out to you? I get a couple, I get brown sugar, like a burnt sugar, I guess. Not a brown sugar, burnt sugar. Yeah, very nice. That usually I get comes a, from the American oak casks, the uh, char, as opposed to toast with European oak. So in the char, they tend to get a deeper burn and you tend to get that caramelized sugar element. That's a nice note. Anyone I, else? I was gonna say, I get um, some, some of that vanilla off of the oak uh, and also, I do have some of that brown sugar, but I also, you know, Sheree will tell you, I tend to drink a lot of bourbon, so I probably am biased to this one anyway. Yeah, <laughs> you, you get that nice bourbon element. The, the things that make bourbon good, you get that sort of sweetness, right. burnt sugar. So there is that mm. element of, you know, obviously comes from the corn, but that's a great, great note. Anyone else? Someone on YouTube said it's spicy. Spicy, excellent. Uh, you know, the spice can come from many different sources. Uh, spice can sometimes come from the, the liquid itself. Sometimes European oak gives spices, as in cinnamon, nutmeg, clove. But spicy can also be warm, as in hot, as in you know, chilly. And that sometimes comes from if it's your first sip of alcohol, you get that lovely prickliness and warmth. You know, we, we talk about a lovely warm alcohol. So great note as well. Thank you very much to those of you uh, on YouTube Live. Thank you. Uh, so this is very much the lighter style. Now, to my mind, this is a very, very light whiskey overall. If you have a 100% American oak aged Macallan, of which there's only one, if you're interested, I'll tell you about it later on. Uh, it is very gentle, but it's also Macallan, so it's gonna be rich. If you've got Highland Park and American oak, you've got that, that sort of peatiness. But this, with the high stills at Glenrothes, those very, very high light alcohols creating stills, married to 100%, Ex bourbon, you get a very, very light style. This is an aperitif. This isn't a digestive. This isn't after dinner. This is before dinner. 
This is just a lovely, you got off work early, it's 3 p.m., you're like, I know what I'm doing for the rest of the day. And it's a much lighter, gentler whiskey. It's a lovely way to start your evening. It's not overpowered. doesn't burn your, your, uh, yeah. your palate out. Lovely, lovely way to start. Uh, very quickly, you know, talk about your, your aperitifs. For me, that's the McAllen uh, Fine Oak Range or a lovely uh, Glenrothes Bourbon Cask Whiskey. And then after dinner, you want to go for a, a more heavily sherry Glenrothes. And then at the end of the night, just to be an equal opportunities, Scotch lover, you want to go for one of those lovely heavily peated ones. Now, uh, there's a like time and a place for everything. I think time and a place for a heavily peated Scotch is after you've been hill walking, mountain climbing, hiking in Scotland. Uh, it's you know, it's the middle of the summer, so it's lashing a brain, and you get down to the bottom of every climbable mountain, every good hiking mountain has what's known as a bothy. A bothy is one of those low-ceilinged, uh, stone-walled restaurant come bar, you know, it's just a little sort of eatery. Uh, they've always got a great Scotch selection, and they always have hearty soups and crusty bread to warm you back up after you've been hiking in Scotland. And there's always a big roaring fire in the corner and right beside that roaring fire there's always a big old dog gently farting in the corner of the room <laughs> now you need those big heavy flavors to overcome you need that, that that heavily peated whiskey to overcome these big rich flavors that's where that comes in useful but with this lovely bourbon aged whiskey this is the start of the evening something very very light so that's a lovely starting point uh, we're going to move on to the uh, the sherry cask reserve. Now this brings this more into uh, Edrington's sort of core style, with McAllen being the big dog and Highland Park being the Batman to McAllen's Superman. Uh, this is very much Edrington style, that heavily sherry, 100% uh, sherry seasoned, this one. Um, now that's going to give a richer set of flavours. American oak grows quicker. Uh, anything that grows quicker has a, a, a a tight, no, sorry, a, a longer pour because it's growing fast. So you get a longer pour, uh, you know, the, the, um, the, the pores of the, the oak don't allow the same penetration. European oak grows slower and the pores are actually more open because they're not stretched. Uh, so it allows greater entry of the scotch into the wood. So because of that, you get deeper, heavier, richer flavors coming out of European oak. That's not to downplay American oak's lovely citruses and melons. Uh, but uh, European oak gives a deeper set of flavours. It's also a different species of oak, uh, Quercus rober, as opposed to Quercus alba, that the American oak. And it's a different set of flavours. If you'd like to reach down, grab, pull out your sherry cask reserve mini, grab yourself a clean glass, or at least rinse out the one you have. Um, if you are rinsing out the same glass, uh, one, because there's going to be a little bit of water in the bottom there, put a little bit of whiskey in there, rush it around, throw it out, and then go for your pour. I'll talk about uh, adding water and ice to scotch in just a second. Kieran, so, while you're pouring, could you talk about uh, the difference between sherry finishing and sherry maturation? That's a great question. Great point. So you might hear uh, other scotch companies talking about finished in port, finished in sherry, finished in, in whatever. Um, Finishing is a process of aging your whiskey for most of its life, usually in ex bourbon casks, but then finishing, giving it a, a, a six month or maybe a nine month finish in sherry casks or port or red wine or whatever. Uh, we at Edrington tend not to finish. We, we don't finish our whiskies. We age exclusively. So if it's in a cask, it's in a cask for its entire life. Uh, we don't finish. It's a more expensive way to make whiskey, but it's a richer flavor profile. And it's something we've done for decades. It's one of those things that we've insisted on because, you know, we want to you know, hold ourselves up to that particular high echelon. So that's, that's a great question, Sri. I really appreciate that. That's a, that's a great one. So this is aged exclusively in sherry casks. Now, sherry casks, as I said before, the sherry industry died a death. So McAllen, Edrington, with our heavy reliance on sherry casks, were like, oh, no, what are we going to do? And it was our core style. So we decided to go the long way, to go the, the, the long route. And we decided to go down to Spain, find the sherry producers, the sherry bodegas, and say, we know that your sales have dropped off. We're going to pay you uh, to fill our casks with sherry 
and you can use it to do whatever you want with after that. It's kind of a Solera system. They use it a couple of times, and then they, they, they can't reuse it after a certain point. And they also can't sell it as sherry because of the way it's been handled. It's not legally classed as sherry. It can be used as sherry vinegar. It can be used as, as a few other bits and pieces. Uh, but a lot, a lot of the time, it's used a couple of times and then dumped out after it's been Solera. It's used a couple of times. Uh, so it's a very expensive process. And we also ship our wood uh, from northern Spain down to southern Spain or from America down to southern Spain. And we have two cooperages that we work with in particular. Tabasa, use our European oak. Vesima, use our American oak. Uh, we have a couple of other smaller ones that we use, but those are our two main cooperages. And just to cover off on the European oak, because we're talking about the sherry, in northern Spain, there's two, there's, there's actually three principalities, but two of them, Galicia and Cantabria, are the areas we get most of our wood from. And in northern Spain, it's heavy, heavy rainfall very similar to, to Scotland, the, the, the rainfall coming off the Atlantic Ocean. And there's great forests there. And interestingly, sort of 200, 150 years ago, a lot of these trees were cut down to build the, the ships for the Spanish Armada. So now 200, 150 years later, there's lots of oak exactly the right age for us. So we've got a plethora of these, these trees to use. Um, and we take that wood down from southern, uh, northern Spain down to southern Spain where it's a lot drier and we air dry the wood. Now, air dry is very important. Uh, when you're building a bourbon cask, you kill and dry, you oven dry the pieces of wood. Now, kill and drying, anytime you oven dry anything, you uh, denature the biologicals. Uh, but all that means is you, know, you, you change um, irreparably the biological components. For example, if you put a slice of bread into a toaster, it comes out as toast. It can never go back to being bread. You can't unboil an egg, right? So when you kill and dry or oven dry these pieces of wood, uh, you destroy some of the biologicals. And it's the biologicals, the lignans, tannins, vanillins, uh, that, that create the flavor. Um, so we uh, air dry takes a lot longer. Kill and drying takes four to six weeks to fully kill and dry or oven dry a piece of wood over in America. Air drying, the way we do it, it takes two to three years to fully dry the wood, where it protects the biologicals. And it means all of these lovely flavors, the vanillins, uh, the esters in particular. A banana smells of banana because of banana esters. It's these, these wonderful biologicals that create the flavor. And we don't denature those and we don't destroy them because we air dry. Very expensive process, but it creates these lovely flavors. Now, Sherry Cask Reserve, a little bit dark, 100% natural color uh, at Glen Rothes. Now, uh, that color comes from A, the sherry seasoning, but B, European oak. European oak gives a deeper color. Uh, and then we use these uh, beautiful first fill sherry seasoned casks. Uh, on the nose, straight away, brown sugar. Uh, you get that lovely, in America, we maybe talk about pancake syrup. If you're in Canada, they, they talk about maple syrup. In the UK, we call it golden syrup. But it's that lovely, rich, you know, syrupy, burnt sugar element. And then it's coming a little bit slower than, than, than McAllen, but you start to get the spices, a little bit of a nutmeg and cinnamon, clove almost even, that sort of lovely, rich spices, sort of fruit cake almost. Yeah, you know, it's like a lighter version of Macallan, but it's not fine milk. It's, it's just a lovely, lovely sweet. And then there's, there's that ever-present sort of dried fruits, raisins, that kind of dried, dried raisins, figs, raisins. Lovely. It's, it's, it's not super rich. There's a lightness to it, but it's just, just very, very, very nice, especially that sugary note up front. But it's not a, it's, it's for, me, for me, it's not that bourbon sweetness. It's not that corn sweetness. It's more that burnt sugar as opposed to, to, to bourbon. Lovely on the nose. And then of course we take a little bite and chew it five or six times. Slange about. Mm. There's no initial attack. There's no initial uh, high alcohol attack. Is this 40 or 43? 40. Mm -hmm. Can't read it. Need to get my eyes checked. Uh, it's a lovely, gentle initial on the palate, and then you get a little bit of tingliness towards the end. Yeah. <laughs> very, very gentle. Yeah. And then you get that lovely. Now, 
with the best will in the world, if you pick up a very, very, very elegant, very, very gentle scotch and you drink it and suddenly it disappears and nothing is left, you kind of feel cheated. You want something. You want it to grip you. You want it to give you a little bit of something, a little bit of burn, a little bit of, you know, you know meat. And, and that's what you get towards the end. Very, very gentle initially. And then a little bit of spiciness. And then that lovely burnt sugar comes in. Bit of vanilla. Just that lovely uh, dried fruit for me. Really, really nice. It's like a lighter, it's a, it, you know, you get heavily sherry whiskies uh, like uh, Abalura Buna or McAllen Cask Strength. Or there are many, many heavily sherry whiskies. This is sherry, but it's the nicer, lighter, gentler version of sherry. I, I think that's absolutely delicious. It's actually, I'm, I'm enthusing because it's been quite a while since I've enjoyed this one. And it's lovely to revisit something that's, that's a lot lighter, but still very, very rich and still very, very, very mm. appropriate. Oh, there's a wee bit of almond again right towards the end. Very, very nice. That, that's lovely. That's, that's a really nice medium sherry. We talk about heavily sherry, but that's a lovely light sherry whiskey. I like that. That's, that's lovely, lovely revisitation. And now I keep talking about this being a, a light expression or a light whiskey, a light brand. And that actually helps me talk about one of the things that we talk about at Glen Rothes. Uh, if you ever get the opportunity to go there and see the distillery, they don't actually run tours. There's no... Visitor center, we were lucky to go and get to see around it. And you walk into the still house and it's like a cathedral. These incredibly high ceilings and a domed roof and a huge glass window at the end. And we do actually refer to it as the Cathedral of Scotch. And the reason for that was James Stewart, when he founded the distillery, wanted to create uh, a space side, a true space side whiskey, but he wanted it to be very light. And to do that, he used these incredibly high stills. And to house these incredibly high stills, uh, he created uh, this cathedral of Scotch. Now, uh, Macallan has the shortest, amongst the shortest stills in the Scotch whiskey industry. Helen Parker in the middle, uh, Glen Rothes are very, very high. The highest in the Scotch whiskey industry is uh, Glen Morangie. Glen Morangie is known as a very, very light alcohol as well. And it takes a very, very light, gentle alcohol to get to the top and progress down the line arm into the condenser. So that's where you get that lovely lighter, gentler, more approachable uh, style. Mm. So absolutely beautiful. Before I go on to our final, final uh, whiskey, the vintage reserve, I said I would talk about adding water to scotch because uh, I get asked all the time, what's the best way? What's the only way, the, the proper way to enjoy scotch whiskey? And I learned a long time ago in scotch whiskey in, in Scotland from a very important person in the Scotch whiskey industry, there is only one true, one proper way to enjoy single malt scotch. <laughs> and that is? How you like it. Oh, straight away, the way you like it. Spot on. Uh, it doesn't matter if you want to add water, if you want to add ice, if you want to, you know, it's the way you like it. Everyone's palate is different. Every single malt scotch is different. Your palate kind of changes, your, your likes and wants change depending on the day, depending on the weather outside, depending if you cycled up a mountain for six hours, you want something different to if you've been sitting and eating barbecue all night. All of these factors affect what you want. Now, the one thing I will insist on is always drink it neat to begin with because we bottled it at a particular strength and style. It's our expression, if you will. Uh, so you always want to try it neat. Uh, the, my, my reason being, you would never go to the French Laundry in Napa three Michelin star restaurant and your plate, your, your main course, your entree arrives and you pick up the salt shaker and you do that. Trust the experts, trust the people who have been doing it for hundreds of years. We're quite good at it by this point. So try it neat to begin with. Then if it's, if you want to add water, if that's your style, then absolutely fantastic. Couple of drops of water, even just a couple of drops of water creates an exothermic reaction excites the molecules, literally, physically and chemically, opens up the chemistry of the liquid. We talk about it opening up, it literally excites the molecules and they bounce off each other and it opens up the, the physicality, the chemistry of the liquid and you get more, it, it gives you different flavors. It unlocks, it gets in behind the alcohol and unlocks some of the flavors that you might have been locked in behind the alcohol. Uh, the general rule though is too much water will drown your scotch and you won't get anywhere near as much flavor. Adding water to scotch is like uh, drinking alcohol while playing pool. 
the winter, then it goes off, right? Take the flame, be very gentle uh, with the adding of water. The, general, the other general rule is it's easier to put more in than it is to take it back out again. So take a couple of drops, a couple of drops, a couple of drops, and find what works for you. And every whiskey will be different, and your palate's different to everyone else's, so don't let anyone tell you what to do. So adding water, absolutely fine. If you want to add ice, absolutely fine. It does not, it closes it down, it literally closes down the liquid. It's kind of going crazy in the background. Uh, ice closes it down. Uh, so if, if scotch is a bit too aggressive for you, a bit too much, uh, then you add ice in it. Kind of just takes the, the edge off a little bit. But again, too many small pieces, too chips of ice creates a high surface area and your, your drink will be watered down very, very quickly. My preferred method of adding ice is the McAllen ice ball machine. You put in a big square, a big cube of ice, and it slowly melts around it and turns it into a perfect sphere. Uh, and a perfect sphere, if you if you remember back to high school, a perfect sphere has the lowest possible surface area of any shape and therefore melts the slowest and it gently lets your drink evolve. And one of those big boys uh, can do two drams, but for me anyway. Um, you might be able to stretch out a bit further, but for me it's two. And your drink just gently evolves over that time. So that's my preferred uh, method. But the molds are absolutely fine. I've also got these molds that are little um, uh, sort of skeleton heads, little skulls. <laughs> that's my favorite one to go. I'm a rock fan, that's my favorite. Um, so adding ice, absolutely fine. If you want to add chocolate milk, <laughs> I will hunt you down. <laughs> we have a question for you, Kieran. Yeah, absolutely. About water. So, what is your take on what kind of water is used to add to whiskey? Do you recommend a bottled water, tap water, purified, etc.? I've got a, I've got a huge long answer to that that I'll, I'll spare you. Um, but essentially, I believe that um, uh, lager is amazing in the Czech Republic because they've been working on it for four hundred years using their water, their air, their barley from their fields, using uh, the, the chemistry and the soil in, in their home. You know, just like bourbon is so good in America because of the water, because of the air, because of the soil, because of the, the grain. Uh, in Scotland, this whiskey was made and uh, sorry, perfected over hundreds of years using a very specific water type. Now the water changes drastically over Scotland because of the change uh, in terroir. Or the, the change of the soil. So Highland Park is actually very hard water because of the, the, the water that's coming down off the high park. Uh, different areas of different waters. Uh, we did a study and the closest bottled water you can buy, the closest to the, the water in Speyside is called Highland Spring. They make it, they, they bottle it in Perthshire, they spring up there and it's the closest. Uh, and we believe that that's, that's the best water to add. So you know, I genuinely believe uh, the, the water is, it can add a little bit to it. If you're adding chlorinated tap water or you're adding you know, whatever, of course it's going to affect things. So getting the water specific, when people go to Scotland, they say, the Scotch there tasted better than anywhere else in the world. It's the same with pizza in Italy or, or the <laughs> New York pizza in New York or Chicago pizza in, in Chicago. It, it's specific and has been developed over so many years. So absolutely source the best type of water for, for, for your, uh, your whiskey. So yes, 100%. So with that, we're running shy on time. We're going to move on with the final one, uh, the Vintage Reserve, ladies and gentlemen. My last clean glass. I'm going to pour myself out. Uh, I, I've just got a text in from my good friend, David Laird, yeah. uh, over at William Grant. He said, are you trying to beard shape me with that beard you have on you, with that beast you have on your face? David, thank you very much. It's lovely to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, by the way, that, that kind of covers off on something else. Um, a lot of people think that this, the brand ambassadors and the, the different Scotch companies are all in competition with each other. Technically, in the marketplace, yes, but all the brand ambassadors hang out and swap bottles and look after each other and invite each other to our tastings because you need to know the category as a whole to be able to speak to the category. So lovely to hear from you, David. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, Moving on to the Vintage Reserve. Now, we've had two very distinct styles, the bourbon style of which different whiskey distilleries tinker with percentages and, and makeups. 
Then you've got the sherry style, a much lighter sherry than some of them. But the vintage reserve is made in a slightly different way. Now, none of these are age statement. Uh, three years ago, when we brought back, uh, sorry, bought back the bottling rights, we never sold the distillery. We only sold the bottling rights to Berry Brothers and Rudd. Three years ago, the first thing we did was add age statements because we felt that the, the reserves were maybe a little bit confusing in this more enlightened age. Back in the day, uh, Glenroth is being a smaller distillery. They didn't have the stock. They didn't have the hundreds of thousands of casks that the big distilleries have now. They had, they had smaller stock numbers and some of that was going off to the blends. So they just didn't have the consistency of exactly 12 year old whiskey. They just didn't have the numbers to create a very, very consistent uh, bottling. So we abandoned the age statements. Uh, the first age statement, I had, it, I had it written down in my notes here somewhere. Uh, we launched a 12 year old uh, in 1987 and then abandoned it very quickly because we just, we just couldn't keep it going. And consistency is key when you're building a brand. So they went to the vintages, but now we have the stock and Edrington very, very cleverly launched an age statement range. There's a 12, 10, 18, 25, there's a 40. Uh, and I think within six months of us launching that, sales were up 221%. It was a master stroke by Edrington. But the vintage reserve is put together using multiple vintages as the name would uh, suggest. Uh, there's, there's a bunch actually written down so that I'd remember. Uh, the, the vintages come from uh, casks that were laid down in 1989, sorry, 89, 92, 97, 98, 2000, 2001, 2004, five, six, and seven. Uh, so there's eight year old all the way up to uh, 26 year old whiskey in there. But the bulk of that um, uh, marriage is the 17 year old uh, 98. So mostly 17 year old whiskey, but there's older whiskey and there's younger whiskey. What that gives the master blender the opportunity to do is to base the whiskey or build the whiskey based on it being a good whiskey, not based on it being strapped to a year. Uh, you know, we. We talk about uh, various uh, higher end bottlings. Here I've got McAllen M. Retails at $6,000 a bottle, no age statement. It's a, an amalgamation of whiskies from different eras. And it's just a great opportunity for the master blenders, the master distillers to, to get the best whiskies they have at the distillery. In some ways, regardless of age, a good cask is a good cask. Sometimes a cask reaches peak maturity at eight, nine, 10 years old. And then it, it'll plateau for a while and then it'll actually go off. Some casks run and run and run and run. And it's the warehouse guy's job to keep an eye on these whiskeys and figure out which ones are the absolute rock stars. And we actually, at Glenrothes, we only bottle around 2% of our overall stock. Two barrels or two casks out of 100 end up as Glenrothes. The rest, go into blending, uh, blending in curry sar, blending in famous grouse. We actually sell whiskies to other blends, to independent bottlers, to other you know, big brands, uh, but only 2%, the best 2% becomes Glen Office. So you're, you're talking about the best 2% over all of these years, but it's mostly 17 year old. Now, as I remember, toffee straight away, it's not, it's not pancake syrup, it's toffee. It's burnt sugar, it's toffee and caramel. That's highly indicative of sherry, ex-European oak. Way more Macallan in that sense. But it's a lovely light toffee. It's, it's not that sort of treacle molasses toffee. It's a lighter burnt sugar, almost like fudge in some ways. Lovely, lovely light vanilla toffee, if you will. Really, really nice on the nose. A little bit of almond, a little bit of coconut. Lovely light, gentle flavors in that lovely sugary element. Lighter color, I'd say this is lighter than the sherry reserve, maybe indicative of not being as heavily sherried. Maybe some older bourbon casks in there with absolute rock stars from the warehouses. And then on the palate. Mm. Very elegant, really, really gentle. Doesn't have the same spiciness as the Sherry Reserve after the initial attack. Uh, with all three of these, you don't get the alcohol in front. When it touches your tongue, it doesn't burn the mouth off you. Wow. You just get that light tingling at the back. Oh, and then my mouth just watered like a Highland Park. 
uh, at Highland Park, we talk about the, uh, what was it, we call it the, 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 the eureka moment. There's a moment where your, your mouth uh, dries and then it waters again. I, I just got that, that lovely Highland Park eureka moment, the mouth watered. On the, on the palate, again, almonds, a bit of citrus, maybe a little bit of crystallized orange peel, that sort of heavier, heavier citrus. That's a wee bit of banana in the back there as well. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to be sticking with this one for the rest of the night. That's absolutely delicious. Karen, we have, we, we have so, another question. Yeah, absolutely. Regarding vintage reserve, can you talk about the blending process, what it's like for the vintage reserve? Are you looking for a specific flavor profile? And if so, what is the blender looking for? One of the great things about these uh, bottlings is uh, the, the master blender is, is given a uh, carte blanche. You're given the opportunity to build something special, especially when it's the first release. If you're building a brand new expression, uh, you want to build something that is just unusual, but at the same time, a great expression of what Glen Rothes is. If you think about it, they've got thousands of casks at the distillery, and some of them are way over here, and some of them are way over here, a bunch are in the middle, there's some that are just out, unusual, some of them go off and have to be dumped out, that's just the process. But when you put together a bottle, you want to put, some, put together something that is very Glen You want it to speak to the brand, you want it to scream Glen Rothes, especially when it's a vintage reserve. It's the vintages, it's the best of the best. So you're putting together something that is just absolutely classic, best we have possibly found in the warehouses. But you also want to put together something that you can repeat. There's no point building something that's highly unusual and phenomenal and maybe very good enough, but it can never be repeated because we emptied that one cask that was just super unusual and we made a great whiskey, but we can never do it again. That's when you put together single cast releases or limited edition releases never to be repeated. If you're going to carry a line on, you want to build something that you can abs absolutely repeat. So that's kind of the thinking. And it really is uh, alchemy put together all these whiskies, uh, trying to create something special. But to my mind, that is absolutely phenomenal. So great question. Thank you very much. Um, that's kind of what I have for you. Uh, other than just to say that uh, Glenrothes was founded as a dress malt. It's a highly, highly sought after top malt, dress malt. The, the blenders love Glenrothes because it adds that top patina of flavor. You built your whiskey, you built your blend, and you want to add richness and flavor and add something special and they come straight to Glenrothes. And that's always been the, 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 the jewel in the crown. It's always been what uh, Glen Rothis has been all about, so uh, I wanted to make sure I've got that in. Uh, apart from that, does anyone have any other any other questions on, on YouTube or, or here in the room or anything else you'd like to? What are your guys' favorites so far? What do you what do you think? I would say I really like the the bourbon cask because again, um, it was the closest to bourbon, but the vintage reserve was delicious. So easy drinking, isn't it? I think I like the sherry cask. You know, I, I like, I don't like an overly sherry, sherry bomb. I just think it hides the spirit. So mm -hmm. I like, I like this one. Cause like you said, it's lighter. You get the sherry influences, but you can still taste the malt. You can still taste the, the, the spirit itself. It's not overwhelmed by the, uh, by the sherry. So I was, I was a star for me tonight. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's like spicy food. If you, if it's too spicy, you don't enjoy the food. If there's too much of one yeah. thing, it overpowers, as you say, hides some of the flavors. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I, I like the vintage reserve and the bourbon casket. They were both they were both very smooth, but they had a nice little kick to it. And I could see myself smoking a cigar and having those two, one of those in front of me, you know, to complement my cigar. So yeah, nice. It's, it's, it's a light cigar, a light cigar with this one. <laughs> yeah. The yeah, Vintage Reserve actually stuff. reminds me of an old Macallan that's a little bit harder to find nowadays, but the 18 triple cask. Uh, oh, yeah. It reminds me a little bit of that whiskey. Yeah, it's got the sherry, it's got the richness, but it's also got the lighter bourbon elements. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a great call. Three, very much so, yeah. Kieran, what's your favorite? Of the three, definitely the Vintage Reserve. Uh, the bourbon was uh, highly reminiscent of a very, very gentle fine oak. Macallan, or, or you know, a, a sort of bourbon aged. But for me, there are so many 
bourbon aged whiskies in the Scotch whiskey industry that, you know, there's lots of rock stars and it's just an overplayed style for me. The sherry I really enjoyed uh, very much, as you said, it's sherry, but it's very, very light. And often with sherry whiskies, they're, they're going so heavily for the sherry that it kind of downplays everything else. But for me, there's just something very, very gentle, very elegant and beautiful and approachable with the vintage reserve. You know, it's just, you know, so many different great whiskies put together to just build a rock star. So, so that was my favorite. So yeah. Any other questions from YouTube? I'd love to, love to answer if there's any other questions. I don't think so. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, if I may, I, I'll, I'll wrap up with a, a little uh, anecdote. Uh, obviously, you know, many, many tastings, many events over many, many years, uh, as brand ambassador from Cal. Um, one of my favorites was on the uh, Queen Mary, which is the a beautiful ocean liner that was built in Glasgow and is now uh, wet docked in Long Beach, just down from Los Angeles. And once a year, they have Scots Fest. It's this big weekend of Scottishness, right? And everyone turns up in their kilts. Uh, I'm not wearing mine down below this, I promise. Uh, and the, the annoying thing was, as Ed, Edrington were not allowed to wear a kilt. Uh, apparently, the, the line is, we don't want our brand ambassadors to look like the lid of a short red tin. So uh, it was always annoying that I couldn't put my kilt. I've got five kilts in the closet. So I'd go there and see all these people with their kilts on. Hundreds of people with different plaids, different patterns. Not a natural born Scott amongst them, but never mind. Uh, and, uh, you know, you walk about, and now everything's very regimented. The tartan is, a, is your family, and the colour of your socks and your shoes and all the bits and pieces specific to your, uh, your, your tartan, specific to the colouring. The only time you have any sort of um, uh, artistic uh, outlet you can just play around is with the sporran. Now, the sporran is this, the, the little man purse in the front, the merce that sits in the front. Now, if, in case you're wondering... The sporin, very, very clever, the Scots. Scots are very, very canny, very clever people. We knew that in 700 years' time, you'd need a place to put your iPhone. Now, the sporin, <laughs> the sporin can be made out of, you know, they're mostly leather, but the top, the, part, the front part of it can be made out of rabbit, badger, stoat, seal. What's uh, a stoat? Stoat, yeah, badger, uh, raccoon, if you can catch them. Basically, anything that can be considered roadkill becomes the front of a spawn. I've seen a fox head on there. And, uh, and one of my favourite things is to try and figure out what the animal is, because my first degree is in biology. Um, and I have worked in the Scotch whiskey industry, and I love to try and figure out what the animal is. So I see this guy and his son marching about with their matching kilts and their matching regalia. And they've both got matching sporins on. And it's a lovely light uh, yellow pelt. Uh, no, not, not dissimilar to your hair colour there, Megan, a lovely sort of light golden pelt, right? Uh, and I'm trying to think, what animal is that? I'm, I'm trying to figure out what animal it is, and I'm thinking, we're close to Orange County. Maybe it's cougar, but it wasn't cougar. And I'm trying to figure out, and eventually, eventually, I have to go up to him. I go up to him and I say, excuse me, I have to come up and ask you about your spotting, because let's face it, I've been staring at your general crotchal region now for about 15 minutes, and we're both uncomfortable. Uh, I have to ask you what your sporin is made out of. I'm Scottish, I work for a Scotch company, I'm a biologist, I'd love to know. And he, his face lit up, and he goes, I'm glad you asked. Golden Retriever. <laughs> the family dog had died aged 14, and they took it to a, a taxidermist to get it stuffed. And he found out how much it costs to stuff a full-size golden retriever. I went, oh, hell no, and took it back, cut out enough from each side to make matching sporins and, and, and preserve the memory that way. And he saw the look in my face. He saw, he went, whoa, whoa, whoa. He saw the, the, the incredulous heartbreak in my eyes as a Scotsman, as a, as a Scotch company employee, as a Labrador owner. As a biologist, he saw the look of incredulous heartbreak in my eyes and went, oh, no, 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 it's all right. She was always sniffing around there. She feels at home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly wish that wasn't a true story. I honestly wish that wasn't true. That was one of my highlights of my years as brand ambassador. So, oh, there we are. That, that shows you how unusual. These tastings can get and the, the, the weird and wonderful 
stuff that we have to deal with. But there we are. Anyway, <laughs> hopefully that gave you a laugh. <laughs> Well, Kieran, thank you so much. You know, I'm glad that we were able to have you here on the Speakeasy tonight to talk about Glen Rothis and walk mm -hmm. us through these whiskeys and really, you know, a lot of people are very familiar with a lot of the other whiskey we sell, uh, the McAllen, of course, but it's nice for them to, I think, you know, be in, this is a great way to introduce the Glen Rothis distillery and what that what that's all about. Wonderful. Well, it was my pleasure to host you all. Thank you very much for tuning in. It's been a consummate pleasure. Make sure you go out and get some of the new whiskey uh, from Glen Rothes, but also there's a few of those older heritage bottlings still around, and it's a great way to go out and try and find these before they're gone forever. So enjoy, and hopefully that's given you more of a background than Glen Rothes. Thank you, thank you. There's a few thank of them you. still out there. Before we entirely go, though, uh, in the nature of our giving more ethos, which is what we all do, uh, I do want to point out uh, a little bit of a charity where Megan and I were able to do an event with Mark earlier this year uh, for Camp One Step. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Camp One Step is uh, run summer camps for kids uh, who have cancer. And this year, obviously, it's a little bit more difficult uh, with everything going on to have these kids at camp and do stuff like that. Uh, but I just wanted to bring up, you know, it, it's 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 part of our, our culture and our nature. And I couldn't go through a, the entire thing without mentioning one step at all. Uh, Shree, if you send me the link, uh, put it on social for everyone else. But if you send me the link, I'll, I'll donate to that right now. Excellent. Thank you Karen, very much. That's awesome. So just to, so with the, I'll say it real fast for Shree. Um, the camp, the camps that they do, it's a pretty amazing thing. They And it's not like it's kind of like people think it's like Make-A-Wish where you get like your last choice to get to go to camp. And it's not that at all. It's kids in all stages of having cancer up to including um, finding out that their cancer is gone. And then they come back and they serve as counselors and they do camp in the summer. They do a trip to um, Utah to go skiing in the winter. They do um, ski trips in Wisconsin. They do all kinds of things um, over the, over the, quarantine what they've done actually is they've kind of had virtual camp because some of these kids are really obviously some of them are really sick but they also now have this camp family that they need to talk to and they talk to all the time and so it's pretty awesome that they do that as well um i was really happy that so so folks don't know shri and i went to grade school together yes back <laughs> in the late 80s early 80s middle early 80s, 80s. early 80s <laughs> and we hadn't seen each other in almost 30 years because we both went to different high schools. And he found me because I was talking about the, um, a poker tournament that I put on. I helped run the poker tournament for Camp One Step. So, Karen, if you get another invite to Arnold Schwarzenegger's, I'll get on a plane and I'll be there right away. <laughs> um, anyway, so Shri offered to do something with McAllen and do something and have a, a tasting there, a, wine and, a mac and cheese party. It was a huge hit for us. We had never thought about doing something like that before the event. Um, it totally worked out for us. And just to give you an understanding, we raised one hundred and fifty thousand dollars that night. Wow! Before we tournament, so wow, that is incredible, absolutely incredible. As, as, as somebody who was a camp counselor for three uh, summers in a row, upstate New York, that that's core to to what I did in, in my formative years, and that sounds absolutely amazing. Congratulations! Thank you. Oh. And by the way, the, the buy-in for Arnie's uh, poker tournament uh, is fifty thousand dollars. But luckily, Shri is very, very wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Shree, not not so much. I wear I wear all kinds of stuff. I well, you can sponsor me. I wear like buttons and blazers and stuff. You know, that would be a Lindsay question. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Let's do <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to thank everybody on YouTube. We're going to stop the live stream. Right